Hi everyone coming in. So, hi everyone, I'm Ellie. So like uh, with most of the things, we're gonna give everyone a few minutes to join so no one misses out. I think there are a few of you joining today. So we'll wait until everyone's, for the most part, everyone's joined, give it a couple of minutes and then, and then we'll get going. Hey everyone. By the way, if anyone does have any um, oh, alcoholic or non alcoholic cocktails at home, feel free to grab a glass. It is six o'clock, so um, the day is finishing uh, for most of you. So well done for those of you that are joining this um, seminar. I have got uh, light and zesty with tonic, which I am using to mark the end of the day. So if you want to make yourself a drink, we've got a few minutes before we get going. Hello, hello. We'll give it another minute or so and then we'll get it going. So coming in. Um, just a bit of housekeeping guys so while we're waiting for a few more to come in I'm probably going to speak for about 20-25 minutes and then I want to make sure we've got time at the end for any questions. So if you do find yourself with questions during the talk, just pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, there should be specific. There it is, uh, Q&A. Um, can everyone hear me? Sorry, someone just said something about Let me let me turn my um airpods off. Yeah, just a little static. Yeah, sometimes head. Yeah, better sound. Okay, no airpods. I want you you want you guys to be able to hear me? Excellent. Um. Perfect. So thank you for flagging that. So I think we will we'll get cracking now. We've probably got everyone now that we've got. So just a bit of housekeeping. If you've got any questions throughout, just pop them in the Q&A box as opposed to chat. And then I will use that um, to answer your questions at the end. So we'll leave questions uh, for the end. So if you've got any as I'm going through, then please do add them in there. Uh, so without further ado, hi, everyone. My name's Ellie. I am the founder of uh, a non-alcoholic uh, tropical spirits brand called Kalenio. In fact, I've got the bottles here just to show you because I'm a big fan of uh, show and tell. Um, so these are designed to be paired with mixers or using cocktails. So I'm actually uh, drinking one now, our light and zesty, which uh, I've just paired with tonics. It's super simple. Um, and if you've not tried alcohol alternatives before you can basically get every category possible so we make non-alcoholic spirits but you can also get beer cider wine sparkling wine um pretty much everything there's a huge range of options so that's my business Kaleno, and i am going to talk to you about a, a few things the main one obviously being a solo a female founder uh, how that's been starting my business this is my first business so I will not have all the answers but definitely I will try my best to to answer your questions if you have any at the end um, I'm going to talk about just getting support around you making sure you've got a really strong support network if you are a, a solo founder and maybe struggling for time um, building a team around you as well that's really important as you grow if you want to grow 
uh, or if you want to expand your business outside of just yourself because we only have so many hours in the day um, and then also finding mentors uh, and advisors and, and basically people that are going to help give you the advice uh, you need to to grow uh, your business or grow whatever it is that, that you want to do um, so just to kind of step back quickly to, to where it all began I started my business Kalenio around uh, three years ago um, three and a half years ago actually to be exact um, I launched Kalenio in January 2019 so some of you may have taken part in dry January so that was basically me five years ago um, I worked for a drinks company at the time who sold mostly alcohol so as you can imagine the Christmas parties were boozier than most and basically um, I wouldn't be exaggerating by saying my life revolved around alcohol literally uh, a tray of spirits new spirits that the buyer had been sent would come out on a Thursday or Friday sometimes earlier in the week um, and you'd be expected to try them and, and maybe give a bit of feedback. So I decided come January to have a bit of a break from alcohol. And this is the first time actually uh, trying to have a break from alcohol, like through my 20s, basically, like most people at uni, um, drank way too much. And then that continued through through my 20s. Um, so came into 2017 with a, with a new mindset. I um, found myself still wanting to go out still wanting to meet with my friends and not just sit at home and do nothing um but what I did find was when I did go out to say like a bar or pub um the options were normally something I didn't want to drink or something that just made me feel uh quite boring and by that I mean you go up to the bar your friends order a gin and tonic and you go well I'm not drinking uh so the bartender says well you can have a diet coke or an orange juice or j2o or something with elderflower in it and most of the time I would end up drinking something that I didn't want to drink um, and the, this, this sort of puzzled me when I lived in a world that was so innovative so exciting uh, full of passion full of energy full of great people that really cared about the brands but when it came to someone that, that didn't want to drink whether that was a you know a life choice or a temporary thing or you know you're training for a marathon or like me you're taking part in dry jan just didn't feel like there were great options uh, for people so uh, a couple of months later after kind of having this idea and this I basically um, thought about whether I could create a non a grown-up non-alcoholic drink a little bit like the spirits that I, I would drink you know either rum um, or gin and I wondered whether I could create something that that still had that complexity that you find in it in a spirit and that really comes through when, when you're drinking with a mixture or in a cocktail. A couple of months later um, I went to uh, Colombia, I travelled out to Colombia which is where I've got lots of family um, and sort of I spent a lot of time there when I was younger, my mum would take me and my sisters there quite often when we were younger for two, three months at a time. And uh, I found myself sort of traveling around the country uh, with this idea, not really sure where I was gonna go with it next, but what this trip really served as, as I guess for me was um, a, a huge amount of inspiration uh, for when I came back to the UK in terms of um, the kind of brand that I wanted to create. I wanted to create a, a brand which really, um, denied this stigma around uh, not drinking and not being fun and being the boring one if you weren't drinking. I really wanted to turn that on its head. And from what I could see from the South American culture was they really knew how to have fun. They would dance all night. Um, you know, they had basically um, this love for life and love for dancing and, and music. And I wanted to bring that energy uh, into the non-alcoholic space. So coming back from this trip, so sort of six, seven months after first having the idea, um, pre-launch, um, sort of the period leading up, so the period between having the idea and actually launching the product or the brand was around two years. So in between that time, um, I applied for grants and bursaries. I basically 
um, got a bursary, which allowed me a little bit of money. I didn't have loads of my own savings, but I put what I could into uh, the brand. So at this point, very much uh, you know, on my own from the beginning, didn't really even cross my mind at this point to, to bring anyone in. I, it was my idea and something I felt passionate about. And it was something that I was doing you know, in my spare time uh, whenever I had an hour or two spare. Um, but I quite quickly became a little bit obsessed with it because I was really excited about, you know, creating something. Uh, so in the beginning, in terms of my support network, so I got this little bit of um, of money, and there are there are there are if you really look for them, there are there are options there. I think we're really lucky in the UK that um, it wasn't just cash, but also training support. Um, you know, webinars, seminars like this, very often free of charge, and you can gain gain a lot from them. So was basically starting to build my support network. My main support network in the beginning was basically family and friends. And I don't mean in terms of um, monetary support, I mean in terms of their time. So um, give you an example, uh, my dad, uh, my two sisters, one of uh, whom actually was my first employee who still works in the business uh, three or four years later. Um, I basically created a huge project plan which uh i'd done project plans before and this was like the ultimate project um if you if you call it that but i treated it like one because there were so many component parts first of all i had to to build out the brand um the the launch plan i had to actually figure out how i was gonna create the product and manufacture it um and sell it and um what was i gonna charge for it pricing so all of these things um the legalities of starting a business so um it, it was overwhelming if you looked at if you looked at the the amount there was to do it, it felt pretty overwhelming um so what i did was just um basically asked my family if, if they would help and so i put in a call every week and we'd have a weekly status um i even look back at, at the status it was very professional um, and I would give them jobs to do. And they were they were small things. So they were things that I could delegate. Um, but it meant that every week I felt like progress was getting made because it wasn't just me uh, working on it. So I think that was a great way to uh, feel like I had what well, I did have support around me. The other thing, um, just a quick one about, you know, asking for favors and speaking to people people you know LinkedIn is a great network I, I used it from from very early on and, and used it a lot of time to find suppliers for things um, and generally have found that people are willing to help or at least will give you an answer or an opinion even if they can't help they might direct you to someone that has the answer so you've got nothing to lose by by reaching out to people so I did that a lot at the beginning I reached out to old contacts and told them what I was doing. A um, really good example was my first brand design. Um, it was a, I reached out to someone I'd worked with um, and they, uh, they're they really interested in the idea. You know, you have to remember five years ago, non-alcoholic or known low uh, industry was quite new to a lot of people, but they're really interested in the idea. And so they basically offered to uh, do my branding free of charges. They work with really big clients, um, would normally charge a lot of money. So that was a really big win for me. I was getting this like amazing agency, really talented designers to create my brand. So again, you don't ask, you don't get. Um, so it's always better to, to reach out to people that you might have come across before and, and just tell them what you're doing and see if they're, they're happy to help. Because you've got to... You've got to be thrifty in those early days, especially if you don't have a lot of money to spend. You need to make every every penny count. Um, then I suppose that at some point, I can't quite remember when, but I do remember having the distinct thought when I was getting out to more events, chatting to people, um, you know, generally reaching out to people and, and going to, to things to, to learn more about the startup space. This is completely new to me, a bit like you guys are doing now, you know, joining, joining this webinar and, and finding a little bit more about, you know, how people start businesses. Um, there was a moment of realisation where I sort of thought to myself, oh, my God, everyone's got um, everyone's got a co-founder. 
and you know they've got a co-founder that looks after marketing this one's looking after operations and this person's focused on sales and I'm thinking well I've I'm doing all three or four of those things and it's tough um so I had like a short period where I basically tried to find a, a, co a co-founder on startup.com or startup.co.uk um yeah anyway I didn't really get very far with it and, and I think I came to the conclusion at this point I was, was quite far in and I thought you know what I've done it done it myself this song or I've got this far with the help of family and friends you know one of my best friends doing my my first website uh, when I when I launched my kind of first hundred bottles she designed the website for me and so I thought you know what I've got this far I think I can I can keep going so I abandoned that idea it's not to say um you shouldn't have a co-founder um I think there are lots of benefits and I think if you are thinking about starting up a business or you're looking at structure I would definitely consider it because um it it can it can be it can be lonely um at times and there can be times where you just think literally I don't know what I'm doing wouldn't it be great to be able to discuss this with someone so um it's definitely worth thinking over um in terms of how I actually you know quick few words on how I actually launched Kalingo so we're now in you know fast forward two years to January uh, 2019 um my first run was a thousand bottles complete disaster spent uh, three months in a very cold room in my bedroom um tr trying to get hold of the bottle that wouldn't answer my calls uh, I think in the end I drove all the ingredients up there get them distilled um and the the, the quality of the labeling wasn't great uh, I really really was not happy so I ended up getting two pallets of, of stock uh, delivered to my parents' house over Christmas. And me and my two sisters basically spent quite a few hours. I mean, I do owe them a lot of time back if they ever start a business, uh, taking off these labels and relabeling every single one, just so that launch would, would be right and would be perfect. Um, and it paid off because a couple of weeks later, I get a call from Sainsbury's basically saying they'd come across my product at an event that I was sampling at um, and they wanted to get into this category and very quickly a snowboard into, we want you to go into 500 of our stores. Um, sort of slight panic set in, but also I was thinking, oh my God, this could be, this could be game changing. Um, uh, and look, I think <laughs> I came into, into that year agreeing a, a listing with with Sainsbury's we were going in in March three months later they needed the bottles by mid-feb so I basically had two weeks to find a new bottler otherwise it was game over so uh, if someone had said that to me before look you're going to be on your own you can have this massive challenge I probably would have said no thank you that sounds horrendous but with every challenge, you find a way, you find a way to get through it and to um, find a way past it. And then, you know, it feels like the worst thing in the world. You know, when I first got that call about the bottles and I saw the pictures, I was devastated. And I thought, oh God, all this hard work and it and it's turned into this. But there is there is always a way. And if you really are passionate and and you really care about what you're doing, you will find um, a way to get through it. I think the, the next challenge for me was very much about starting to build a team. And I want to touch on a, a couple of the things that I've learned uh, during that time. And this is someone who's coming from, um, I didn't have, um, I didn't lead. Um, well, actually, no, I, no, I did. Um, I had a small team in my role before I, before I launched a business, a few people, but basically wasn't a leader by any stretch of the imagination and certainly didn't have um, much experience at all in recruitment or um, hiring directors or managers uh, so I had to had to learn quite quickly for the first six to eight months in the business I was able to to do a lot of the things still myself just about uh, you know the operations finance marketing events it was it was definitely a massive learning curve 
Um, but my biggest obstacle was I couldn't be in, in two places at once as much as I would have liked to have been. Uh, so I, de- I needed help. I needed to start building my core team, you know, operations. I needed to ensure we had a reliable flow of bottles coming through sales. I needed to get those bottles onto the supermarket shelves and back bars. And then in terms of marketing, I needed to ensure that people knew about us uh, and where to buy from us. Um, So started with myself and in the past three years, I've grown the team now to over 15 people. Um, And I just wanted to touch on a few things I've learned along the way. Um, And I wish someone had told me in the beginning, because I probably didn't ask the questions because I didn't know they needed to be asked, but I do now. Um, and, And I've said some of these things before, but you know, out on LinkedIn, because I'm a big believer in sharing your learnings to, to ensure that um, others can, can learn from you. I think number one is, is hiring for the right attitude, over aptitude and skill. You can teach, you can teach skills, um, you can give people the tools, but you can't, someone doesn't have the right attitude um, in terms of that hunger to grow and grow with you and learn you're never going to be able to teach them that um, no matter whether you give them the right tools um, or try and go grow their skill sets. And the other thing I think is uh, something I did do was just figuring out early on what values were, were important. So um, writing those out and then relentlessly hiring by them, rewarding people by them, you know, when they, when they do demonstrate those values and just keep reminding people that these important these are important to the business because ultimately what that's helped me do is, is build the right type of business and um, people that are like-minded, but also build a really strong uh, culture. And, and I believe hiring great people is the single hardest thing to get right. And no one gets it right in the beginning, particularly if they're new to it. Um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, quickly touching on kind of mentors and advisors. Like I said earlier, quite often people are very happy to help you, just have to ask. Not everyone will have time to talk. You know, they could be super busy themselves. Um, you know, apologies to anyone that's ever reached out to me, particularly in the early years, because you know, my main focus is just making sure my business is still running <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, But when I do have time, I definitely try and and give back. Um, And there will be people out there that can give you time. Uh, You just have to ask. Um, I think if you can find a regular mentor who understands your industry and has worked in it for a number of years, who has a track record, either for free, you know, maybe they'll be happy with stock or paid um, if you can afford to pay them some money. You'll be able to ask the questions that, that you can't ask anyone else or that you're maybe afraid to ask um, other people because you fear of feeling stupid, um, which you're not, by the way. It's just you've never done these things before. So I've had um, a few mentors over the year and they've massively helped me. And the other thing is just making friends with others in your industry. Guaranteed, you know, there are people two or three uh, years uh, further than you in their journey and they very often have shortcut answers to things that would otherwise otherwise take you days to figure out so connect with them meet them for coffee join the right whatsapp groups and just ask the questions because ultimately it will save you a lot of time and if you're on your own if you're a sole founder then time is everything so to summarize uh, challenges and rewards of being a sole founder because there are rewards it's not all um negative or definitely isn't all negative like as I said before, it can be lonely and you don't often know what the right answers are. That's okay. You can spend time figuring out or, you know, get in touch with the right people that can help you make the right decisions. Ultimately, the final decision rests with you. That can be an opportunity, a strength or a challenge, depending on the kind of person you are. If you're decisive or not very decisive, that may sit well with you or it may not you may wish to surround yourself with more people and get more opinions before you uh, form uh, form a decision or an answer um I guess the plus side is you'll learn more and faster on your own just purely and simply because you're exposed 
to more parts of the business that you may otherwise um you may not have been um uh, i think finally i think you'll feel proud to have, have got there on your own at the end of it and in spite of maybe all of the challenges and obstacles that uh, have been thrown your way you'll feel proud that that you've got there uh, on your own so that in a nutshell really kind of <laughs> whistle stop tour is my own experience of of being a, a solo female uh, founder by accident or by design that's kind of the path i've chosen and so hopefully some of you who are on that path it's okay um you'll find a way and those who are who are thinking then that kind of gives you uh, a bit of a view from from my perspective so hopefully that's helpful we've got a bit of time at the end uh, for questions so i'm going to quickly whiz through uh, from the top so uh Nethmi, your journey is so inspiring any advice on how to face those nasty confidence gremlins or tackle Thing, imposter syndrome yeah it's a good question um i think uh, in my experience confidence has built for me over the years by actually uh, realizing that i can i'm very capable and that i can do things i just was never really given the opportunity so you know maybe see this as, a, as an opportunity to really prove yourself or uh, something that can help is you know proving people wrong that perhaps didn't think you could do what you're doing and almost using that as a bit of a catalyst to go, you know what, I can do it and I will do it. So I think just if you, you're not always going to feel confident. First time I got up on stage, I was really, really scared and nervous and probably trembling. But I think you can fake it until you make it. And then, you know, naturally that confidence will start to build um, and it will become a lot easier. Um. Please, can you can you please let us know about grant bursaries? I'm not an expert on on grant bursaries, but all I can say is just you know whatever industry you're in, there are usually uh, and again like I say in the UK we're really lucky. Um, just have a look, make sure you you look around for for opportunities that are available uh, for you, whether that's mentorship or whether that's actual money that will help you kickstart your business. Um, thank you for the great questions, guys. Uh, it's another one from Nethmi. How did you find juggling full-time work and working on Colonio uh, and finding the balance to work on your passions? So, yeah, a lot of people ask this. Um, very practically, so I worked, so what I didn't say for the, when I had the idea from when I launched it, I didn't quit my job straight away. Some people do that if they're very excited about the idea and they've they've got the finances to support them to do that or, a, you know, a partner that can help or whatever it might be, your family. Um, I had a mortgage to pay. So I, I continued working full time for a year and a half. Um, and I would wake up at five and work on my business for a couple of hours in the morning work on it at lunchtime if I had the time and then when I got back work on it again uh, sometimes I would take a week off you know if I was visiting pubs and bars to get feedback on my product I would take sometimes a week off for a couple of days off here and there um, just basically all the time I could get but I wanted to do that because I was really it, it, it didn't feel like a, a slog to get up early because I was really excited uh, Gareth, how did you apply for funding? What was the process? Um, so I came through kind of um, Accelerator who were linked to investors. So quite often it can, you know, some brands can, can do that. It can be linked to mentorship or support. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is to do your research. There are lots of different types of ways um, of gaining funding um crowdfunding is one sometimes you need to have proven out the business before you go because otherwise they might want a lot of equity because there's more risk there um so i would say do your research uh, particularly for your industry what's what's the norm um what's worked well because there could be different types of funding uh, from different types for different stages in your business um where are we now do, do, do. so 
Anna, what was your transition like from working a full-time day job to committing full-time to your brand? Did you rely on income from your main job to get started? Um, so my manager was very understanding and he let me work part-time for a period of time from when I from when I quit my day job, which helped. Um, I had a little bit of money coming in from the bursary and like kind of forward grant, um, which um yeah would come off the investment if I got it so that very physically allowed me um, the financial freedom to to quit um I have to say it was it was a lonely time um those early years and um when I think back to it it was very rewarding when I when I finally got to launch but you have got to be quite laser focused and just you know figure out what am I doing this week what am I doing today and just um you've really got to set uh, set your schedule so that can be that can be a bit of a transition to begin with um Catherine sorry I'm going to probably go over a few minutes if that's all right for everyone Catherine uh, would love to know what sort of things you delegated to your family to help with um so I'm lucky enough to have two sisters that work in marketing. So a lot of the things were researching events or feeding back on marketing plans, getting an extra point of view. Um, my dad was an Excel whiz and really helped me on the finance side, which I wasn't as keen on or as strong in. Strong in. So definitely try and delegate to people. You know, if someone loves being an Excel spreadsheet and that's they get their kicks out of that, then delegate that kind of job to them um, because they won't see its work um, what kind of networking events did I go to anything with startup in the title anything with you know SME anywhere I could go to talk to other people that were doing the same kind of things as I was just to understand things I didn't know because I'd never done this before um, what were the best events you recommend to attend for budding food and drink startups oh gosh uh, there are probably loads bread and jam is a really good one for budding food and drink brands they they have retailers down there you can pitch to them they have amazing talks I'm there uh, in a few weeks time talking about sustainability um, but I've been a, a you know a participant many many times before there are some really good Facebook groups um can't quite remember the name but there are some food and drink ones out there where you can just ask any question or search and you'll basically find your answer um so eventbrite's a really good one to search actually if you go on eventbrite and search by you know a category food and drink is often one of them or startup or business you can uh, often find relevant events uh marina how many employees do you have have now at what point would you recommend looking at bringing others in uh, others on board totally depends on what your cash situation is if you've got investment so if you can afford to bring people on or if you're um turning over enough that you can afford to bring people on i think your first few hires are going to be really important i started with sort of mid uh, management position so someone in ops in fact that person was ops she was my sister, but she did operations and marketing. So in the beginning, you'll probably have roles that are split across a number of areas. So you do need people that can turn a hand to a few different things as opposed to just specialists in one. Uh, and then eventually those roles become more defined. But in the beginning, it does help to have people that can, uh, you know, potentially turn a hand to a few things. Uh, how can you validate that a business idea is viable? And decide what is the optimal capital to invest initially before knowing whether it be pick up. Um, so I can only speak from my experience, but I spoke to a lot of uh, pubs and bars in the in the early days uh, to validate my ideas, um, asking them if they would buy the product and speaking to their customers, getting them to try the product. And again, finding out if they'd be willing to pay for it, how much I had like a a quick app survey that I did to get quick feedback so that got me hundreds of results and um, so that's that's a, a type of validation you can do you know informal focus groups where um 
try and get people you don't know because I generally find family and friends won't always give you they, they'll want to kind of support you so they might not give the most impartial answer um you know all of that was free just me turning as me and my time turning up to the pub uh for a night um do we have any recommendations for platforms website builders for social media manager we later um a website builder um oh this is thinking back now I mean, Shopify, you can build uh, templates from Shopify. Um, um, yeah, I have to come back to that. If anyone else knows, put them in the, the chat. WordPress is another one. Um, sorry, just running through. Thank you for all the questions, though, guys. They've been amazing. Let's mix it up a bit. So... Um, do you have any plans to diversify or go into other markets? If so, what they be? Yes, so we're definitely um, going into other markets at the moment. Finally, Brexit and COVID did uh, delay our plans slightly, but we are entering new markets. So it's a new week. Uh, we're going into Australia, we're going into other European markets. So we've spent the three years really building out the market in the UK, which I would always recommend. It's a really solid base, not necessarily the UK, but just you know, proving out one market, doing that well before you spread yourself too quickly across lots of other markets. Um, and then, sorry guys, just conscious of time. Um, light and zesty is a gin alternative and dark and spicy is your spice rum alternative. Do you have any plans to launch others? Potentially, um, we've, you know, we're not, uh, we're not gonna be a four or five uh, product brand we're really focused on the ones we've got but always keeping an eye on innovation I think you always should uh, just keep an eye on what's going on in the market and what's important to your customers is the key thing so I ring up customers and, and find out what, what they're liking what they're not liking do they have any ideas well um cool I think we're pretty much there um so Thank you very much. Unless anyone wants to kind of pop on screen and ask any other questions, I think we can we can do that if you raise your hand. Talia, who's in the background, will help me. Hi, Hi um, Ellie. Just yeah, we have one person on screen right now. We just wants to ask you a question. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Perfect. Hi there. Um, yeah, I've just been chilling in the background. Um, so yeah, uh, really, uh, really cool to hear about your story, Ellie. Uh, I just saw on your website that um, it's like Bogota to Bristol, and I'm from Bristol too, so that's awesome. Um, I have two questions. Um, yeah. So the first one is you, you spoke about mentors. Um, what is like the best way of, of finding someone in a similar space to you that gives you know really valid advice? So that's the first question. And the mm. second question is is how do you avoid burnout as a, as like a solo founder yeah um the so first question um the simple answer is just get out to events that are relevant to your industry and talk to people or use linkedin so um like depending on what industry you're in um mine obviously mine strengths i'll use mine as an example but mentor I want to find someone that's been in the drinks industry for a certain number of years has maybe grown a brand themselves or have worked with founders that have grown brands so I'll be searching for certain things on LinkedIn or I'll be putting the feelers out when I'm going to events um, that are related to drink the drinks industry because that like more often than, than not you ask a few people they're like oh I don't know but I can I can introduce you to someone that might know someone so I mean most people will have if they do that as a professional they might have mentor or something in their title. Okay, cool. And then second question, how do you avoid burnout? Um, that every, everyone's got different, everyone's got different coping mechanisms um, for, for stress and different kind of stress levels they can deal with. I think just knowing, just knowing what your, what your maximum is and, and trying not to get there and just really managing your time you know you're no good to anyone including yourself if, if you burn out so just really making sure you take breaks have even if you're going a million miles per hour so I've always in the beginning it was a little bit difficult but then I always think the first year or two you're it's a sprint so you're really trying to kind of gain 
traction, critical traction. So you do need to put the hours in, but um, you know, I make sure I, my weekends are my weekends that I switch off. That really helps me reset and kind of come in on Monday with the energy to kind of go again and take take on the week. So just find things that, that help you reset and do that. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks for the questions. Um, I don't know if anyone else uh, wants to ask a question. Probably have a little bit of time, maybe last one. Otherwise, maybe we'll... We have we'll, one more yeah. person that's raised their hand. So I'm just bringing okay. up the stage. Thank you so much. No worries. Hi. Right, I, I'm going to apologise now. I've got two very small toddlers running around. <laughs> don't worry don't worry it's 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 almost seven <laughs> oh, no, juggle everything um, but i've really enjoyed listening to you and taking it all on board thank you so much for giving us all your time no worries um i in terms of a mentorship this is something that i'm i'm looking into hmm. uh, and do you think it's better to kind of maybe just take some free advice um from people that are willing to give or um what about a paid mentorship is that something that you did or you would recommend um I mean so paid advice you can kind of you can have it you can probably have it more regularly mm. um you know they're going to turn up to sessions they're not going to move things around or change um uh, you know meeting times because they're busy yeah um but then again you know the free side it depends what you know what they want they may just want to there are a lot of people that just want you know have, have run successful businesses want to give back and therefore they are willing to give, you know, an hour or two of their time a month or half an hour a week, whatever it might be. Mm. Um, but I think, I don't think there's any right or right, wrong answer, but I think if you have got someone, I think it's good to have someone regularly so you've got that consistency. Yeah. So if you can find that and, and not have to pay for it, great. Mm -hmm. um, you might find that, I think you know there's things called business coaches out there I, that I think it's like different you want someone that's maybe in your industry that can yeah. give you yeah give you friend, one of my friends has got a company and she pays for mentorship but they um I don't know if you would class it as proper mentorship but he sets targets and you know they hit one level and then, then they go to the next one I thought that does actually sound quite um helpful but yeah, yeah it, it hits that point if you can, I mean, if you can afford it and you're getting the value out of it that you need, then absolutely no problem at all. But I guess in the beginning, some people can't can't always afford to pay. To yeah. Pay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your thoughts. That's okay. Bye. Bye. Uh, Kelvin, you're up on screen. Did you want to ask a question? Or oh, you're on mute, Kelvin. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Um, I joined quite late, but um, I'm also a freelancer and I um, do everything myself. So yeah. I wanted to ask, um, working with, um, let me say, a, a food brand or a beverage company, what kind of content, or being in that space, what kind of content would you like to see? Because um, that is something I would like to do, enter into the food industry and create creative content for them, productive pro um, production content and be able to sell those brands, um, especially, most especially those in the small and medium and um, scale business. So um, what kind of content do you see um, that will be the next thing for the food and beverage um, industry uh... to sell them? Yeah, good question. I mean, if everyone, every brand's different, which means their requirements will be different. But, um, you know, seeing a lot of, of growth in, uh, you know, video content, um, particularly platforms like TikTok, uh, potentially YouTube. Um, so though, those are brand like in terms of being able to create content for those, you know, these these types of channels are really kind of content heavy and yeah. you have to be really consistent with it so uh, the other thing is i don't know if you have a, a niche within within what you focus on but you won't be able to be everything to to all brands so you know maybe finding like something you can specialize in or, or something that 
fits a certain type of food and drink brand if that's um, that will that will sometimes help because a, a lot more often I'm finding uh, brands like us want specialists in certain areas as opposed to like broader like broader capabilities if that makes sense yeah so um the reason I'm asking is that recently um I currently have a um almost a done deal with a a, a biscuit company and they want us to create content for them most especially because our TikTok um when we post on TikTok it's a bit trendy on our platform but the thing is that um we want to also be able to create the content that they are happy about and also their customers are happy about and that is where it's a bit shaky because we want to understand and they just give us the creative room to do whatever we want to do but then they the want to know with the biscuits or with the food and beverage industry how does it work like what kind of content would sell out to them that's why i asked the question yeah i mean like to be honest the the best thing to do would just to be go out and do research like the view the views don't lie um the engagement doesn't lie what are the brands that are similar to to that particular uh, brand or or product that are getting loads of hits and are getting loads of engagement. What are they doing in their content that's different to everyone else and kind of, you know, figuring that out and going, can we, can we replicate that model? That would be kind of the, yeah, best answer I give. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think I've probably taken up enough of everyone's evening, so we'll leave it there. But thank you very much, everyone, for having me. Um, really, really great questions. Really enjoyed answering all of those. And hopefully my experience has helped in some way, shape or form. So I just want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining. And uh, if you're interested in the product, it's Kalenio at drinks.com. Um, or at Kalenia Drinks. Um, and if you want to find out a little bit more about mindful drinking, I've also recently started a podcast called The Joyful Drinker, which you can find on Spotify and Apple, all of the usual platforms. So really great guests there with different perspectives on moderating throughout the week. Thanks so much, Ellie. Have a nice evening. Right. You too, guys. Bye. Bye.